It's my pleasure to introduce our, our, our first speaker of the afternoon, Mauricio Velasco from Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. And I'll be speaking about some vignettes on sums of squares on varieties. All right, so uh, can you guys hear me? Jared? Yes, we hear you. Oh, good, excellent, okay. Um, so, all right, so first of all, uh, I would like to, to thank the organizers for the opportunity of giving this talk, uh, which is entitled Some Vignettes on Sums of Squares on Varieties. And this mainly a survey of some joint work with Greg Leckerman, Reiner Sim, and Greg Smith, uh, which we have conducted over the last few years. So, um, the main characters of this talk are two convex cones, uh, which we will call P and Sigma, and in this first slide I will simply define them. So let's suppose that F is an n-variable polynomial with real coefficients, uh, and we say that F is a non-negative polynomial, and write F belongs to P if it assumes only non-negative values in Rn. Uh, second, we say that f is a sum of squares and right f belongs to sigma if there exists an integer t and polynomials g1 up to gt in the same ring such that f is the sum of their squares. So by a sum of squares here we mean a sum of squares of polynomials. Now um, these two objects are the, the main characters of the talk and what I want to begin by doing is explaining to you why do we find these two cones important uh, because they are important for very different reasons. Um, the cone of non-negative polynomials is important because it allows us to formulate global optimization problems. So what's a global optimization problem? Suppose you have a given polynomial f and you ask what's the smallest value that this polynomial can take in all of our n? Since it's in all of our n, that's why it's global. Um, turns out, and this is something easy to see, that this number alpha star, this infimum, can also be rewritten as the largest lower bound on f. That is the biggest real number lambda such that f minus lambda belongs to our cone P. And this rewriting, although it's really an elementary statement, the fact that these are two ways of computing alpha star is conceptually really quite useful. Um, this reformulation allows us to write uh, global optimization problems as linear optimization problems over affine slices of the cone of non-negative polynomials. And this reformulation is useful not only for rewriting the question, but also for solving it. And uh, with this point of view, uh, there are many, many, many applications to, to this idea. For instance, if you want a, a concrete collection of references, because it's an enormous object on which I really don't have time to, to discuss, I recommend Lasserre's book, Moments, Positive Polynomials and Their Applications, where he's discussed how these ideas are used in probability, uh, statistics, control theory, game theory, automated theory proving, many, many other areas. So P is important because it allows us to model interesting problems. Now, sigma is important for very different reasons. It's important because it's simple computationally. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, suppose that somebody asks you the question that's written here. Is the polynomial F that's written down here non-negative in R2? Uh, so you look at it and well, I don't know, at least I don't see a clear way of how to establish that statement. But if the question was, is this polynomial non-negative in R2, then the answer is obviously yes, because every sum of squares is a non-negative polynomial, because by evaluating a sum of squares, you can only obtain sums of squares back, which are non-negative or the reals. Um, and of course, this polynomial and, and that one are the same. You expand, you obtain the same f. So, um, so yes, yeah, so writing a polynomial as a sum of squares is a certificate of its non-negativity, but the key point is that Constructing such certificates can be done in an efficient manner computationally. So if I only gave you F and asked you find a sum of squares representation, then that's something you can actually do. The, the reason is summarized in this remark, um, which I will explain now. So a polynomial F is a sum of squares of elements in a vector space V of polynomials of dimension E, if and only if there exists an E by E symmetric matrix, which is positive semi-definite, meaning all its eigenvalues are non-negative real numbers, and that satisfies this equality, f equal to m transpose a m, where m is a vector whose entries are a basis for my vector space. 
this, this might be kind of quick, but the main point is that constructing SOS certificates reduces to a, a kind of subfamily of optimization called semi-definite programming, and in particular, constructing some square certificates reduces to semi-definite programming feasibility, while optimizing over the cone of sums of squares is an instance of semi-definite programming. And even if you don't know what these things are, the key point is that these are things that we can do very quickly. So in polynomial time, at least numerically. So P matters because we can do global optimization, we can formulate global optimization problems with P, and sigma matters because we can solve them with sigma. And so it's very natural to ask, do the two cones agree? If the answer was yes, it would be really good news, right? Because you could take your important problem, formulate it using P, and then thinking of P as sigma, if the two cones were the same, you could solve it using sigma. So, so it's really important to know whether this is true. Um, and maybe more specifically, what I'm going to ask is for which degrees 2D and numbers of variables n does it happen that every non-negative form of degree 2D is a sum of squares? And this question was asked in the past and uh, thoroughly answered by Hilbert himself in 1888. Um, and maybe the, the conclusion is sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. There are situations when sigma and p agree and situations when they don't, and Hilbert explains exactly which is which. So let me read the statement. Every non-negative form of degree 2D in n variables is a sum of squares, even and only if either n is equal to 2, the case of bivariate forms in any degree, or d is equal to 1, the case of quadratic forms in any number of variables, or in this exceptional case of ternary quartics. So this was the starting point for our, our investigation, and, and really what we asked is, can we find a natural context where we can understand, uh, where by understanding we mean fi finding a geometric explanation for Hilbert's theorem, and hopefully generalize it uh, to, to other situations. Um, and, and, you know, at least the, the beginning of this talk is uh, that is such a context, a context that we believe allows us to, to do all these things. Um, and that is the context of real projective varieties. So in the rest of the talk, let X inside of PN be a real projective variety, by which I mean a reduced, but not necessarily irreducible scheme defined over the reals, and let S be its homogeneous coordinate ring. Now, in real projective varieties, we can define analogs of the cones P and Sigma, and that's what I'm doing now. So the cone of non-negative quadratic forms Px is precisely that, the collection of quadratic forms, that is elements of S2, uh, which assume non-negative values at all affine representatives of real points of X. And uh, sigma X is precisely the cone of sums of squares of linear forms. So the Fs in S2, which can be written as sums of squares of linear forms in the coordinate ring of the variety. And in this you know, all the motivation I gave earlier is equally valid for this P and this Sigma. P still allows us to model global optimization problems and Sigma still allows us to, to solve them in the same way as before. So it's natural to ask, for which projective varieties does it happen that we get equality? Uh, and maybe a quick remark, uh, my definition, my original definition of P and Sigma involved forms of all degrees, while when I have defined them on varieties, I only speak about quadratic forms. That might seem, in, at first glance, to be much more restricted. However, this is not the case because I'm looking at arbitrary varieties. So, quadratic forms in the D fairness embedding of X correspond to forms of degree 2D on the variety X. So, so re restricting to quadratic forms is really done without loss of generalities. So again, we ask the question, for which projective varieties does it happen that we get equality? Uh, and I'm going to tell you quickly a partial answer, which is what happens for the case of irreducible varieties. Um, so let X inside of PN be a real projective variety, and we are going to assume, first of all, that X is non-degenerate, meaning it's not contained in any hyperplane in PN, and totally real, meaning that the set of real points is very risky dense, and second, let's assume that X is irreducible. Uh, and then our theorem says that, uh, this is joint work with Greg Beckerman and Greg Smith, um, it says that the equality Px equal to sigma x occurs if and only if x is what's called a variety of minimal degree, 
which means that the degree of our variety is equal to one plus the co-dimension of that variety. So how is the theorem useful? Well, it transformed a rather difficult question, whether or not px coincides with sigma x, into a very simple question, which is whether or not the degree is equal to one plus the co-dimension. One just computes degree and co-dimension and compares, and that gives you an answer to the question. Now, um, let me quickly go through what are varieties of minimal degree. Um, um, so, yeah, so let, let me explain maybe, yeah, so, so what, are, what are varieties of minimal degree? So if X inside of PN is a positive dimensional, irreducible, and non-degenerate variety, then its general hyperplane section is also non-degenerate. This means that if I start with X, I can slice with dimension many hyperplanes and reach a zero-dimensional set whose cardinality is the degree. But because of the statement that's written on the slide, this zero-dimensional set has to be non-degenerate in a projective space of complementary dimension to X. And therefore, it should consist of at least co-dimension of, of X plus one points. So because of that reason, the degree of, of a projective variety, right, an irreducible projective variety right, is always bounded below by the co-dimension plus one. Uh, and moreover, uh, the equality occurs if and only if the zero-dimensional intersection we considered before consists of a basis of uh, a subspace of complementary dimension. Okay, so uh, varieties of minimal degree are precisely those varieties which when you intersect with a complementary subspace, you obtain a basis of this space. Um, okay, so this is why they are called varieties of minimal degree because their degree is as small as possible when, when the degree really reaches this lower bound. And something important that one needs to know is that um, these varieties were completely classified by Del Pezzo and Bertini in the late 19th century. It's one of the great achievements of the Italian school of algebraic geometry, of classic algebraic geometry. Um, and it's basically just a, a list. We understand exactly very well how these varieties are. Um, so uh, we have been able to describe completely all the varieties which are ideal from the point of view of sums of squares, those in which P and Sigma coincide. Now, let me go extremely quickly through the idea of the proof, because what I, was, what I was aiming for is trying to get some geometric understanding as to why the theorem is true. Uh, and we, we believe we got some of that. So the proof consists of two implications. First of all, we want to show that the equality uh, is preserved under projections, no, or rather, first of all, we, we will show that the equality, px equal to sigma x, is preserved under projections away from real. Okay, this means that if you have a variety X where P and Sigma are equal and you project away from a real point, you obtain another variety where P and Sigma are also equal. So you repeat this procedure, called dimension of X minus one many times, and you reach the hypersurface case. And now for hypersurfaces, understanding when PX is equal to Sigma X is pretty easy. That's an interesting, over I mean, it's, it's an exercise that you should do. For hypersurfaces, the equality occurs if and only if X is a quadric hypersurface. So uh, this line of reasoning shows PX equal to sigma X implies that X has to be of minimal degree because after you project away from co-dimension minus one many points, you must be in the quadric hypersurface case. Now, uh, this only gives us one direction. For the opposite direction, what we will show is that whenever the difference occurs, then your variety cannot be. So if you start with a variety px different from sigma x, what we proved is that the difference, the fact that the two cones are different, is preserved under generic hyperplane sections. This is a deep theorem. This requires a lot of different tools, where what I really want to do is mention that all these results come from a combination of convex geometry and complex geometry. And it's one of the reasons why these techniques were not accessible in the 19th century, because there has been a huge development of convex geometry and, and of complex geometry. We use mainly modern tools from convex geometry to, to, to really go through this, to be able to obtain these results. Okay, so if you know that the difference is preserved on the generic hyperplane sections, what you do is you start with your variety X, slice until you reach a complementary subspace, and then you check, and again, this is an interesting exercise, that for a set of points, the equality between P and Sigma holds if and only if X is a linearly independent set. So if you're not in a variety of minimal degree, 
So if, so if, if Px is different from sigma x, then you are not in a variety of minimal degree proving the other inclusion. So it's really about varieties which when intersected with complementary subspaces give you linearly independent sets. That's really the geometric reason why the statement works. Now, uh, what consequences does the theorem have? Well, we can unify and generalize many results gathered in the literature. For instance, suppose you look at the varieties that are Veronese embeddings of Pn for various degrees and various ends, and you ask, when are these of minimal degree? And you do a small calculation, and this gives you Hilbert's theorem that we described earlier. Second, let's suppose that x is the zeros of a quadric, uh, and then you obtain Yakubovich's theorem from 1971 from a theorem. Then uh, we could also look at Segre Veronese embeddings of process of projective spaces, and ask when are these of minimal degree, and easily you would obtain a theorem of Choi Lam and Resnick from 1980 on multi homogeneous beef biforms. And more generally, if you think of rational normal scrolls as story varieties, you can obtain new results on sums of squares and the polynomials. When you, what you do is you constrain the support of the, polynom of the polynomials. Um, so, so these results allow us to unify and generalize results that, that were already known. Um, but more importantly for us, suggest that this point of view is useful, that, that something I want you to do is look at the classical results of semi algebraic geometry and ask whether or not they can be extended to this context of, of projective varieties. And this is what I will do in the remaining. Jared, can you tell me how much time do I have? You have, uh, say, uh, uh, four minutes. Four minutes, perfect. Okay, so in the remaining four minutes, let me tell you other directions in which we have taken this research. Each of these is, is a paper and will be a subject of a, of a longer talk. Um, and so why do I call them vignettes? Because I'm going to go through them really quickly, hopefully some information we trust. Yeah, we'll see. So the first vignette out of two is uh, how about denominators? So in 1927, Artin showed in his solution of Hilbert's 17th problem that every non-negative polynomial admits a representation as a sum of squares of rational functions. So it's not true that every non-negative polynomial is a sum of squares of polynomials, but it is a sum of squares of rational functions. And in particular, if you clear denominators, you can write it as a ratio of sums of squares. So this is what we try to do. You give me a non-negative polynomial, something f in p, and I need to find g in sigma such that f times g belongs to sigma. If that something is called h, what I'm doing is I'm writing f as h over g. Uh, and we ask, do such representations exist on varieties? Existence is actually pretty easy. This is not such an interesting statement. It's really just semi-algebraic geometry. Um, but what we want is really to understand how large does g have to be? This is, again, very important algorithmically. Um, and uh, and it's something that we cannot yet do in all projective varieties, but luckily we uh, were able to do it for, for curves. Um, so let me read the, the theorem. So let x inside of Pn be a totally real non-degenerate curve of degree D and arithmetic genus Pa. If f belongs to P in degree 2j, 2j, and k is greater or equal than this quantity, the quotient of twice the arithmetic genus over the degree, then there exists a multiplier g of that degree. This is the, the key point, such that the product f times g is a sum of squares. Crucially, these bounds are sharp, and this might be the only known sharp bounds uh, on uh, Hilbert's 17 problem type, type of theorems. So that's, that's one direction. So vignette number two, uh, one can also ask about the efficiency of sum of squares representations. So again, in 1984, Feister showed that every non-negative form in Rn has a rational SOS representation involving at most two to the n squares. So how many squares do you need to write a sum of squares? Uh, and we, we from, from you know, generalizing this idea, uh, one can define the Pythagoras number of a, project, of a real projective variety to be the smallest number of squares that suffices to write any element of sigma x. Uh, and one can ask, what can be said about these numbers? I mean, can, can, can one relate these numbers with the geometry of the variety? And, and turns out one can. We, we, we wrote a paper in which we, we have many results, uh, but maybe the, the one that I wanted to highlight is that there are also structured theorems about varieties where these Pythagoras numbers are very small. 
And this is nice because algorithmically, these varieties are of great interest. Um, so, so the theorem is the following, if X is totally real, okay, maybe I should say, we prove that the Pythagoras number is always bounded below by one plus the dimension of X, and that it's equal to one plus the dimension of X precisely for varieties of minimal degree. So a natural question is to ask, when is it next to minimal? When does the Pythagoras number equal two plus the dimension of X? And this is what the theorem does. Basically, I will just read it and finish the talk. If X is totally real, irreducible, non-degenerate, and arithmetically Cohen Macaulay, then the following conditions are equivalent. Uh, the Pythagoras number is two plus the dimension of X, meaning it's next to minimal, and uh, the variety is either one of almost minimal degree, meaning the degree is two plus the co-dimension, or uh, X is a uh, sub variety of co-dimension one in a variety of minimal degree. All right, um, so this is what I want to say. Thank you very much. Um, let me just conclude with a few references where all these the several vign the vignettes are, you know, properly analyzed and developed in each of these articles. And if you find this object interesting, maybe I should mention that uh, as a part of uh, a course organized by Paolo Parrillo and Rekha Thomas in the joint meetings of the AMS that now has become a book, uh, I wrote uh, a little chapter called Algebraic Geometry and Sums of Squares, which is a, an, an introduction to, to this object, which might be of interest to, to some of you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, but before we all applaud him, let's just, uh, let's uh, jump into questions. So if you have a question, please, please raise your hand. Uh, in the meantime, there are a few questions posed in the Q&A. Uh, the first one is by Cesar Poma, asks, which tools of convex geometry were used in the proof? Yes, so, um, so, well, the, the key point is that um, if you have, for instance, a polytope, this polytope has you, you, you can think of it in two ways, as an intersection of a bunch of half spaces, but also as the convex hull of a collection of vertices. Uh, an analogous statement is true about every convex set. And the question is, what are the vertices? These vertices are the extreme rays of your, of your convex set. Um, and the kinds of convex sets that we care about, which specifically are the dual of the cone of sums of squares, are a particular kind of convex set, which is more general than a polytope, but less general than an arbitrary convex set, which is something called a spectrahedron. Uh, and uh, there is an understanding of the facial structure of spectrahedra, and in particular of how extreme faces look like. So that's, that's one of the key ideas. Uh, and uh, this is something I should say. Uh, the very first application of these of this modern ideas of convex geometry is in a paper by Greg Bleckerman, uh, which is called something like non-negative polynomials and sums of squares, where he went through Hilbert's original proof, and, or, or rather he went to Hilbert's original statement, and in precisely that generality uh, was able to, to use these methods of convex geometry. So if you want to see the details as to how are these ideas useful, uh, that is really a, a great source. Um, yeah, so, so for instance, to, to make one more specific statement, if you look at the extreme rays of sigma x tool and you look at the extreme rays that are not of rank one, they produce uh, some base point free linear series. And the behavior of base point free linear series on varieties with long linear strands, that's really the, the algebraic geometry techniques that we apply to, to, to prove this here. So we, we have a, another question. This one is from uh, Jordan Ellenberg. Hi, Mauricio. Uh, Hi, Jordan. How are you? Awesome. Awesome talk. I remember seeing Greg Smith talk about this a couple of years back. It was super interesting then, super interesting now. The new stuff is great. Um, so here's a question I have. If I, are there any varieties which are not of minimal degree? I don't know, like in cubic or like whatever it may be, where I can explicitly describe the positive cone. I mean, we know squares are not enough, but is there some other larger, finally describable class of positive functions which generates the That's cone? An extremely interesting question, yes. So, so, so for instance, we understand the extreme rays for varieties of almost minimal degree. That's something that we, we do know. We understand the extreme rays are rank one things and some other rays that are more complicated. And that's useful because, because if you understand the, the rank one points of the cone, you know that everything is just combinations of these guys. That's one, that's one, that's one possibility. We still have not been able to use this to, to algorithmically in any way, but it's a true statement, something one should have in mind. 
But the other thing is also uh, through projections. So if you have a variety X, which projects onto a variety Y and the map has some a few nice properties, for instance, that every real point is the inverse image of a real point upstairs, which is not, not, not always true, but let's suppose that we have that. Then, then what you can do is pull back uh, non-negative quadratic forms to the variety upstairs. And even the variety upstairs, you understand things, then this gives you something. So for instance, if I took a variety of minimal degree and I projected away from a point, not on the variety, but outside, I will obtain a variety of slightly higher degree um, where its non-negative forms are something that I can understand because I can pull them back to the, to the variety of minimal degree. So that's something quite interesting. So, uh, you know, algorithmically, the question would be, if I give you a variety, how do you know whether this variety is a projection of a variety of almost minimal, of, of minimal degree? And that's, well, there is all this technology of on projection, which should allow you to, to algorithmically think about this problem. Um, so that's, yeah, so those are maybe the, the, the two directions in which I, I could take your, your question. Uh, I'm going to allow one more question. Uh, Zinevi Reichstein has a question. Are there similar results for higher degrees? So say uh, cubes of linear forms. Ah, that's an interesting question. So, so, so you know, there is there is all this work on Warren's problem, right? On, on whether you can write, uh, you know, things as as sums of powers of linear forms. Um, and there is a yeah, there is a huge collection of results in in, in this direction. Um, but uh, but in a sense. The, 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 the weakest condition, you could say, is being a sum of squares, right? If you, if you are a sum of six powers of things, then you already are a sum of squares. And so since there are very few varieties where sums of squares allow you to describe non-negative polynomials, uh, you could ask, okay, would, for instance, fourth power suffice on, on, on varieties of minimal degree and analyze each of them? I don't know the answer. Something it's more specifically, I was wondering if the methods that you used um, apply to higher degrees. I, I think they do, yeah, in, in the sense that, well, no, 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 let, let, me, let me take that back because uh, it is extremely important that sigma x dual is the dual of the sums of squares because being, being non-negative on squares is precisely that a certain matrix is positive semi-definite. If you want to be non-negative on fourth powers, then that's a more complicated concept. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah. So I guess my, my I, let me change my 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 quest my answer. I, I believe that the methods do not apply. Uh, that fourth powers or the, the dual of the sums of fourth powers is very different from the dual of the sums of squares. Thank you.